wonderful afternoon. I didn't mention this in the opening announcements, we, but we do have several guests with us tonight. And uh, you don't normally worship with us. And so for your presence and for your willingness to come, we're thankful. And so hopefully uh, the few minutes that we spend together has already been beneficial. I hope that uh, the remainder of it will be as well. Remember, ladies, remember the class tonight at our home after services and remember the class tomorrow night for everybody at our house where we'll be looking at some things from the book of Ecclesiastes. If you can, come and be with us. Uh, we only spend an hour in that and we would love to have you come and take part in that study. So we'll look forward to that. And then, of course, Tuesday night, the college class will meet at Robin Griffin's home for the last class this particular year. And we'll pick that back up in the fall, of course, only if the Lord wills. But we'll hopefully be able to do that then. Again, good to see all of you tonight. I have not traveled extensively throughout the world uh, like a lot of people have. I have been fortunate to go to some places that, uh, that probably most people in this country don't get to go to. A lot of that has been related to preaching, and I'm grateful for those opportunities. Several years ago, <clears throat> on my way back from the Czech Republic, I was able to stop in Rome. And I had never been there. Uh, some of you in this, uh, matter of fact, let me just see a show of hands. How many of you have been to the city of Rome, Italy? Raise your hand. Uh, we've got several. Excellent. That's very good. So some of these pictures will be probably fairly familiar to you. And those who haven't been, I hope that they will be helpful to you. But I want you to think about something in reference to Rome, at least initially, before we look at some passages from the Bible tonight. Uh, that watermark's on there, obviously, from Archaeology Illustrated. And uh, we don't want to disobey any copyright laws. But I want you to look at this picture. This is a depiction of what the Roman Forum would have looked like, a rendering of that at the time of the first century, really at, uh, really at the zenith of the empire. And I think what's interesting about that, and if you go to Rome today, uh, obviously it looks considerably different than it did back then. As a matter of fact, this is something similar to the way it looks today. And you can see a lot of these ruins. The Roman Forum was really the center in Rome of activity, of government activity, political activity, social activity, religious activity. But in the time of Christ and in the first century, for several centuries really, this was where the, the bulk of Roman activity took place. And if you go there today, this is pretty typical of what you will see. Of course, that particular area is in ruins. And I'm not going to point out some things. That's really fairly insignificant. I just want you to get the overall picture of what was there. And, what, and, and that's really what I want you to see. And as those of you who have been there, you can appreciate this. You can walk along this Roman Forum this area, and you can walk for, for several blocks. I don't know exactly how long it is, but you can see several, a lot, all these ruins, and they will tell you what these particular ruins are. And it is impressive because it did happen, and those are really uh, buildings and parts of buildings and, and monuments and, and, and arches that were there, of course, in the time of Christ. And so that is impressive for a number of reasons. But there are several arches that are still present. Those, these arches were built by the Romans quite often most of the time to commemorate a victory of some sort. An emperor would go with an army and they would conquer areas and their arches are not just in Rome, they're in other places throughout the world, but a lot of them are in Rome. For instance, the Arch of Titus is in Rome. This is probably one of the most familiar. The Domitian, Emperor Domitian built this, I think in about 82, because he wanted to commemorate what his son Titus, or rather his father Titus had done. And so this is interesting, and, and uh, if you've been there, you've seen this Arch of Titus, and you see some of the reliefs there have to do with the, the siege of Jerusalem and other things that happened in A.D. 70. But this was built uh, in honor of Titus and the conquering armies who came through, not just Jerusalem, but in other areas and conquered different people throughout the world. 
There's this uh, arch as well, the arch of Septimius Severus, who was an emperor as well later. It's not as familiar to us, but this is in the northwest corner or the northwest part of uh, the, the Roman Forum. And so you see these structures, you see these arches quite a bit. And again, they're to honor these emperors. And then one that you, most of us have seen if we've been this is the Arch of Constantine, or Constantine, which is located, as you see, fairly close to the Colosseum. And again, these were built to honor, usually honor these emperors. And this particular arch is the largest of all of those that have been erected uh, to these emperors. And as I said, the, there are arches like this all throughout Rome and all throughout Italy. And it's not just in Italy itself. There were triumphal processions, as you might expect, in the first century and throughout the empire when a king would come home. And so the king would be honored, honored with these, in essence, what we might call a parade where they would show their force and they would typically bring in those who had been conquered. Not, not everyone would, that they would bring in, but they would certainly bring in captives to show the force and to show the power of the empire. And so from where the emperor might sit, it might look something like this. It was very elaborate. And it's something that was very impressive. And of course, we have parades even today that help us kind of understand the idea about that. But it's that backdrop. It's all of that backdrop in the first century when that, those parades were going on, when those captives were brought in, in these kind of parades, that helps us understand some things about Scripture. I want you to turn your Bible to 2 Corinthians. I want us to look at this passage for just a few minutes. 2 Corinthians 2, beginning in verse 14, says this. And if you think about what was going on in the empire, and even some of these arches were begun in the, in the, when the republic was there. And as the empire, of course, came, they were conquering more people. So this was very prevalent throughout the empire. And so even when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, they understood that. And he wanted them to understand the kind of captivity that they should be in. They were, they were, he was trying to help them identify what was going to happen to them and how they should view that. So again, he paints a picture that they're going to understand. He says this, Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading, or of death leading to death and to the other the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? Paul is trying to help them understand that in essence they are captives for Christ. He talks about this triumph in Christ. And again, they, they would have to work that, but they understood again what he is talking about. He describes service to Christ as, as somebody who is following a conquering king. And they would understand that concept pretty well. And these captives, as I have said, these captives were part of the parade. They were spoils of the, of the captivity. They were spoils of the war. And not only were there captives who would be led, but there was incense that was burned. So the aroma and the smell throughout uh, all the parade route, if you will, it was very common. And music was played. It was a... It was, it was a a very exhausting thing. And it was a very prominent thing. People understood what was going on. And very often to honor and to bring glory, if you will, to the king, to the conquering king. At the end of the parade, some of these captives who were led through the streets as part of the spoil, some of those captives would be killed. And that was simply to honor the one who had been the leader of the conquering army. So the captive was in honor of the king. And what Paul says to these Corinthians is, is that we're captives. Paul's a captive. Timothy's a captive. Titus is a captive. And I want you to think for a minute tonight that we are captives as well. We don't tend to think about ourselves that way. But we are really 
disciples who have been taken captive, in essence, by a king. And we are, in essence, marching, and our being kept captive is to those, to some it is a sweet smell, and to others it is the smell of death. And he says, when you see these captives, you're saying something, and, and their reaction to it could be one of two ways. As I said, it could be the smell of death, and it could be the smell of life. So I want to ask you a question tonight. When, when, you, when you hear this passage, and when you think of yourself as being a captive, what is it that you promote what is it, let's use this language, what is it that you diffuse? When people see you, what is it that they are saying? What is it, that, this is maybe a more graphic way to say, what is it that they are smelling about you? And I mean that in a very real sense. What is it that, that your life is saying and do they see you as someone who is captive to Christ? Do they see you as someone who promotes the aroma of death? Let's just stop for a minute. What would that even mean? If he's talking about disciples, if Paul says we, we triumph in Christ and we diffuse, to some we diffuse the fragrance of death. You ever thought about that? What does that mean? We diffuse the fragrance of death. Well, seems to me, in contrast to the fragrance of life, it, it's a contrast that says the way they're living their life has no meaning. There's no really good outcome to that. It is an outcome that even in this case is going to lead simply to death. They don't see past that. And there are some people who think that the way we live our lives is just that that's how we choose to live. But the outcome's not going to be very good. The outcome's going to be no different for us than anybody else. So that outcome presents in their minds the aroma of death. In, our, in essence, we have wasted, I think, maybe is the idea, we have wasted our lives to live as we do. And so people don't see that as of any value. But he says, to some, you are the aroma of life. I, I, I think that there are some folks, and I think this is how we obviously perceive each other, but I think there are some folks who look at our lives and they perceive us. I hope that they perceive us to be something different. They perceive us as people who have said we are willing to stand for something and we are willing to die for something. And they don't look at it as that's just the end, that that's just the outcome is that they're going to die. But they see what we try to live. They see this as this is a way to promote who Christ really is. That's what Christ wants us to do. He wants us to be that fragrance of life. And there is something that compels people who, who I think, who promote that idea. And I, and I bring this to your attention tonight because this is what we're all trying to do. This passage in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul would say this, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. There's a lot of death language in that, right? But there's a lot of death language in that because, is, because we understand that we're willing, at least in theory, we're willing to die for him because he has loved up. It's the love of Christ that compels us to do that. That's why we live as we do. That's not to say we live perfectly, but it is to say that, that we live our lives so that we can give off or diffuse the aroma of Christ to people around us. So the real practical question here is, when people look at your life, let me ask it this way. When people look at your life, what do you smell like? Isn't that a good way to put it? What do you smell like? Do people smell in your life the fragrance of death or do people smell in your life the, fra the, the fragrance of victory? And the fragrance of, yes, someone who is a captive, but someone who is captive giving off a good aroma and understanding why they're doing that. And so... The last question that I would ask for us to think about and consider for just a moment is, do you consider yourself captive to Christ? I think that's a real hard concept for us to understand. We see ourselves, I think, like the children of Israel and, and, and saw themselves. You remember when Jesus told the Jews, 
you're captive. And they said, we've never been captive to anybody. We never, we, we, it talks, it says, children of Abraham, you, you, you're, you're held captive. He said, they, they said to him, what are you talking about? And the fact of the matter is they'd been captive most of their lives. For generations they'd been held captive. They didn't even realize it. And I think sometimes it's a difficulty for us because we don't understand captivity. We live in a free country. We can come and go as we please. There's not anybody really anywhere, for the most part, telling any of us, you can't go here, you can't go there. You don't have that kind of freedom. We're not held captive. And because of that, I think it's difficult sometimes for us to understand that. We live very comfortably. Now, let me, let me say about that, that I don't think what the Lord intends is for us to go outside or, 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 or to change our circumstances necessarily and make our lives miserable so that we can live as captives. I don't think he's saying that at all. I think one of the great blessings, at least that I believe I have, is I live in this country and I have the blessings that I have. Now, God expects me to use that, those blessings and that prosperity in, in what is in his best interest. And so let me say this, I must see myself as a captive but what I want you to think about is I may do that in a little different way than they did literally in the first century. So I want you to think about just quickly three applications that I think we can make. How, how do we see ourselves as captive? These, these are, I think, they're, 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 they're very obvious, okay? But I just want to call, call them to your attention. The first one is this. I think we need to be willing to be inconvenienced. We're not talking about captives here. We're not talking about literal captivity where, where, where we're being, we don't have any freedom. We're not talking about, we're talking about a lifestyle wherein we make choices. And you know what most of us, you know the choices that most of us want to make? We want to make choices that benefit us. It's who we are. Am I right about that or am I wrong about that? Most of us do what we do because it's what we want to do. And I think part of what we need to be as those who are triumphing in Christ and really are even now are, are, are held captive, if you will, and are to be captive to Christ and this triumph in Christ is we need to be willing to be inconvenienced. That sounds like such a benign word, doesn't it? Inconvenienced. And that, that's like when, when I'm leaving work and, and I'm trying to get home and Beth says, would you go by the, run by the store and get something? That, that may be an inconvenient thing. And that's such, a, that's such a small word really, isn't it? But I want to ask you a question. How willing are you to be inconvenienced for the cause of Christ? I, I'm really asking the question. I'm asking myself the question as well. Some of the things that Ben Hall talked about last week in reference to us proclaiming the glory of Jesus Christ and being priest, if you will. Part of what he's talking about is us being willing to be inconvenienced. And I'm talking to myself too now. I'm talking to all of us. And while we're not held captive in the sense that they were, we need to be people, I think, who are willing to give of our time when maybe it's not the most convenient for us to help those who have spiritual needs, to help maybe those who have physical needs, to help our brethren in a variety of ways. And this point, I'm not making this point because we don't, but I'm making this point to say this may be a practical way in which we can do even now what they were asked to do. Because we don't face the same things that they faced. So I just want to encourage you, and I want to encourage me, as we can, as we have opportunities, let us be willing to go out of our way. That may be another way to say it, but go out of our way to accomplish the very things that he's talking about. And then, let me mention this. That's kind of a poor way to say that second Statement: Don't change the message for a better smell. I, if I'd have given a little bit more thought to that, I might could have come up with a better way to say it. But I think there are a lot of folks who are trying to change the message so that it smells better. I know that's the case. 
And in some cases, those who are trying to change the message so that the aroma that it gives off to everybody else who's outside, for instance, sometimes what they're doing when they do that is they are making what appears to be progress. Now, I think one of the ways that we can maybe apply what we're talking about is we must never water down. We must never change the message just so that we're trying to water it down. We always ought to be open to what the message of the gospel is and continue to seek to try to find that and help teach others that in our lives and in the lives of others. But we don't need to change the message for a better smell. In the 17th verse of this same text, 2 Corinthians 2, Paul talked about those who would peddle Peddlers, those who would peddle the gospel. Some translations may call them hucksters. They're, in essence, saying things because that's what people want to hear. I can tell you right now, folks, if we changed our message, if we tried to change a message to, to, to something that would, that would, in essence, smell better to people out in the world, we could do it, and we could fill this auditorium. I believe we could. I believe we've got the manpower to do that if we change our message. But that's not what the Lord wants. That's not what I'm willing to do. That's not what our elders are willing to do. I don't believe that's what any of you are willing to do. We're going to stay the course. We're going to keep trying to do our best. We're going to keep being willing to be inconvenienced, but we're going to keep doing that. We're not going to change our message. And may we be people who never will change our message unless we find our message to be something that it needs to be changed for. But we always ought to be searching and always be trying to preach that same message. We don't want to be peddlers. Peddlers preach ease. <laughs> peddlers preach what people want to hear. Hey, you know this as well as I do. Just, just take a trip around town. Out in the county. Take a trip around town or out in the county and just go by church buildings that have particular signs and notice what some of those churches are doing. I'll tell you what they're doing. They're peddling the gospel in a lot of ways. Not all of them. Not all the time. But in a very real sense, they're watering down the message and they're peddling the message. We can't do that. We should never do that. We must teach what Jesus taught. I think from my knowledge, that's always been the case here. We want, we want that to continue to be the case. Let's always be willing to do that, but let's always be willing to practice that as well. And then finally, let me mention this. This is, this is not hard. We had to bear fruit, okay? Again, I think if we're going to be captive to Christ in the sense that we can make the application of that, we need to listen to what Jesus says. By this my Father is glorified, that you may bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. So the question then for all of us is, are you and I bearing fruit? Is that a way we can apply this idea of being held captive to Christ? And are we willing to bring glory to our King by doing just these three things? You know, I don't know, what, there's probably a lot of things we could put on this. I think there are. But just think with me tonight, if you're, if you're willing to do just these three things, you're willing to be inconvenienced, okay? That's not a problem because you're, you're held captive. You're not willing to be inconvenienced. You don't want to change the message. We're going to preach the message of Jesus Christ. You're going to be convicted to the message of Jesus Christ and you're committed to bearing fruit. Whatever that means, whether it's in service or whether it's in teaching or whether it's in helping, whatever that is, you're willing to bear fruit. Just think about those three commitments that you can make if you're not already made those. Just throw those three commitments and I think that's a way to apply what we're talking about. Yes, we may have to die for the Lord. We eventually, hopefully, can die for the Lord. But there are ways even today and even right now that we can be people who are willing to be captive. We can turn ourselves into captives for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I, I, I just think it's a good passage for us to think about. And that's what I wanted to do tonight. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, you ought to be. If you're here tonight... And